right. So I'm just waiting to see Jen get on this screen and then we can talk about all of this. Let's see, I need to go, uh, where is this? Sherry, okay. Let's see how I find a human. Jen, Jen, okay, cool, you are here. So now I need to invite you and where, where is, where do I invite you again? Okay. Jen, can you request to, yes, thank you, okay. All right, waiting for Jen to get on now. Hi. I did, hello. Hello. <laughs> I like when the hardest part of it is just technology and we can solve it really quickly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, the reason why I asked to talk to my good friend and trainer, Jen, is one, because she's the, the movement expert who also can explain very simply these concepts around why does your body work the way it does. And if you saw one of my more recent posts where I put forth that I had a really hard time repeating the same thing, like, more than once, I began to wonder what am I missing, right? There's always a strength to being who you are and pushing that forward. And if you listen to Huberman, he would say that that is building flow, which is the opposite of building brain plasticity, right? I'm not feeling anything, I'm just doing what I like. So what am I feeling at by not, if we go into like what I don't do, which is sets and reps of like weight training, what am I missing? So, Jen, if you can just explain that part and go wherever you want. <laughs> so, I think, and it's funny because after you and I spoke about this on the phone yesterday, I started thinking about it and I trained a client that I've been working with for a little while and I was thinking about what she was experiencing. And it's multifaceted. So, when you think of something like proprioception, proprioception can be trained many, many, many different ways. All you need to do to start improving your proprioception is move. One way you can really create a lot of proprioception around specific aspects of a joint movement is through strength training. And the thing is, when you start, when you do something repeatedly, it stresses the tissues repetitively in a similar way, and those tissues adapt and get stronger. So, so about that, that's also like what people do when they're just repeating bicep curls and when I started an exercise, like back in the 80s, the concept was you're ripping your muscles, and so therefore they're, they're building more cells, so that's how they get bigger. Yes. So that plays into it, right? If you want to make your muscles bigger and stronger, there's that yes. going. But that's a different thing than increasing proprioception. Well, not really, because the mechanoreceptors that are embedded in the tendons, ligaments, and joints, they respond to load one thing they respond to is load. So whenever you stress the tissue, you're imparting load upon that nerve cell, and that is going to facilitate a, a, a sense of stability and awareness in your brain. So another way to think of what's happening when you start to build strength in a systematic way, the more boring way, the sets and reps way. And you don't actually, the thing about sets and reps is you don't actually need to do very much of it to make a pretty profound difference, but it creates a sense of center. And I hear this with a lot of my clients who have the propensity to be very flexible and fluid and, and have these beautiful movement patterns. But when they start building strength and they start using a, more a heavy enough load that they feel constrained, they'll tell me, I feel way more centered. And it's that increased proprioception, I think, that is what's creating that sense. So um, when we talk about doing things to the point of failure, mm -hmm. what's that about? That's definitely a philosophy. And it is supported by science. I mean, there's definitely, if you really want to stimulate a fairly quick change, in your strength, going to failure is a way to do it. I find that, I don't care for that. I find it uncomfortable, so that's not how I do things. But a lot of, I mean, but, but again, there's science to support it, so it's a way to do things. So um, yesterday when we were talking, you mentioned that one of the ways that you create an equation around how many reps would you do 
is that you take the load that you press to the point of failure and you decrease it to 70%. And then you said you would do like four at 70%. Why is that? What are the effects? So the way this, the research looks at that is it's more actually what's your one repetition max? What's, what's the maximum weight you can lift one time in this position? So like if you were squatting, what's the maximum amount of weight that you could squat? So that would be 100% of your one repetition max. And then from there, you can say, okay, my goal is to build power. I really want to tap into the fast twitch muscle fibers. I want to become more explosive. And because of a bunch of research that's been done mostly on men, mostly in the collegiate or athletic setting, the, you know, the, the research that would say, okay, well, so we want to do four to six repetitions, probably of four to six sets, you know, of like 75, or it's probably more like 80%. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but like 80% of your one repetition max. And then you say, okay, well, what about those people that are just built, looking to build strength, right? Now, strength and power could be argued. These are pretty similar things, but they're a little bit different. Someone who just wants to build strength, they don't care about how fast they can move the load. They just care about being able to get up from a chair in a, or pick up the dog food in a way that's not injurious. They're going to say, okay, th again, what the research shows, I'm going to do 70% of my one repetition max. It's like six to 10 times, and that's going to build my strength. And then there's like this whole separate thing where it's like, okay, I want to build muscular endurance. I don't, you know, I, I don't care maybe as much about being able to pick up the dog food really well. I want to be able to do something for a long period of time. So then you're looking at higher repetitions at lower, um, lower percent or at a higher, no, sorry, a lower percentage of your one repetition max. Would that be also something where something like zone two cardio comes in? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we can also maybe categorize, like strength could be something overall having to do with your body's ability to go through life and health, whereas power is more about performance. It's more about like specific spikes where you want to achieve more with one particular um, focus, or goal. Yes, jumping is a great example of power. I want to be able to jump up onto a box comfortably. You need explosive power to do that training, again, those higher loads is going to facilitate that action. Not everybody cares about that. <laughs> At this point, I said science, there are going to be specific protocols that one can probably find by doing some research online. Yes. It's the particular performance goals. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, now I'm just going to, because you know me, I talk with my hands on my body. I'm going to just grab like an eight pound weight because it'll be easier to talk about things I'm thinking if I have that. Um, so the, the place, the place where this conversation initiated from is basically, if we're going to do like a physical demonstration here that I, when I am training, I'm not like just doing this for a bunch of times. And then I'm not like doing this for a bunch of times. I wind up starting with this and then I wind up like, oh, maybe I'll do a Turkish get up. And then maybe, oh, like, let's try a pistol swap thing here. Huh, that doesn't work. How about if we go here? At which point I can't remember what the hell I did. But there's still a benefit of having had load. There's a benefit of having had movement. There are synapses firing in my brain. And it would be like, you know, Feldenkrais under load or something. So if you take this idea, because I know you know about Feldenkrais, you know a lot about it, you taught me a lot about it, and you also know strength training, what would be a benefit of doing something like Feldenkrais under load with just experiential movement for a certain amount of time? That's, well, it's, so variable movement also increases your proprioception, right? So again, there's so many ways to train this idea of where is my body in space, which is unconscious. It's an unconscious awareness that we all have, regardless of whether or not we specifically train it. So something like holding on to a weight, it provides a constraint. You figure out ways to work around it. You're going to come up with more available movement options, maybe things you've never even considered. It's like, oh, cool. I can go here. Oh, no, that did, like you said, that didn't quite work. What happens if I go this other way? Which is very much what Feldenkrais did with his awareness through movement lessons. And he'll have you do really crazy things like you're going to hold on to your foot while you do this rolling pattern and let's see how that shows up. Or the more popular one that becomes a challenge pretty frequently on Instagram 
is what happens if you put shoes on your hands and shoes on your feet while you're lying down. Can you figure out a way to roll over? It is a really interesting, again, it's a constraint, right? But you could do something similar with, with weights, especially if it's, not, if it's not so heavy that you, you know, don't have to, fi you're super constrained by how you navigate it. So there's that value in it. And plus, it's good to just play. It's good to see, like, here's this thing. What happens if I play with it? <laughs> it's good for your brain and for learning. And you were also saying yesterday that you know, repeating any movement pattern increases efficiency. So yes. if you constraint, and after, we should also take a moment to just explain like what is a constraint, but uh, why don't we do that? Let's, what's, an, what's a movement constraint? Anything that eliminates a joint's degrees of freedom. So for instance, if I want to get up and down from the floor, and I'm gonna do it however I want. My joints can move in whatever way they want. I have no constraints put upon me. If, on the other hand, I hold something in one hand, suddenly that hand can't participate in the movement the same way. I've added a constraint. And can a constraint, it can, so it can qualify, it can be something physical where you right. build an option, or it can also qualify it as a rule. So a yeah. movement around a bicep curl would be, I am going to only bend from my elbow and bring it back into my shoulder. I am not going to be doing this. Correct. Yes, exactly. So a lot of Jen's exercises that she would give me were movement constraints based on time. For example, she, and this is not just me, I, mean, I follow you on Instagram as well as we've trained a lot personally. Um, one of my favorites is put on a timer for a minute, glue your right foot to the floor, get up and down in all the different ways that you can possibly think of. And there's also like the sets and reps idea of that turned into you have a time limit or time. Yes. And I find that a really fun way to train actually. And you can build strength that way too. Like I've done pull-up training that way. Like, okay, I'm going to set a timer for 30 seconds. I'm going to do as many pull-ups as I can in that period of time. I'll rest whenever I need to. Whatever the number is, the number is. Again, there are so many ways to get stronger. And I think we tend to attach to this, this idea that it has to be super regimented. And it doesn't really. I mean, it is nice. Again, so sets and reps are a constraint, right? It is sometimes nice to have those rules. And I certainly follow those rules to an extent for my workouts. But then I make sure I have plenty of time built in where I can play. Yeah, like in your pull-up program, you know, you had hanging with hanging, uh, passive. And, yes. then and then pretty soon, like I think within the level two of it, you had playing on the bar sideways. Yes. A, move, a time limit for that or a 10 goal. Yes. Because again, and that's going to build more, that's going to build more muscular endurance, but still it, it all kind of interplays with each other. It does all add, right. you know. Because there's like a gradient where your muscles are, they have more power at the beginning. They're going to be able to de degrade by the end. The power will if you're just doing it. But also your brain is firing a lot and it's finding more efficient ways. So one is going up as the other is going down. And through that, you're building endurance and stamina. Yes, yes. No, that's very true. And I know, again, there's a lot of ways to, to do strength training. But some people will do, they'll start off with a relatively heavy weight that they can only do four times. They get to their fourth repetition. They set that weight down. They pick up a lighter weight. Mm -hmm. And they do that for another, you know, so those are drop sets. But um, there's a lot of ways to play with a lot of these ideas. They're not, again, it doesn't have to be fixed in stone. <laughs> I don't think there's anything, I think that as soon as we try to fix things in stone, we arbitrarily set limits that just don't allow us to hit particular goals. Right. Um, the uh, example that I wanted to pull up is, you know, in the gyrotron system, and I would use my tower, except my whole room is a disaster, except for this particular course right now. So we're just going to pretend that the, uh, this pool is a handle. And so in the Gerritana system, like, you know, I was talking to you about this yesterday, we tend to repeat things eight times, I think, because the musicality of ballet. Yeah. Things eight times. And there is a, there's a level of rhythm and musicality to it. Yes. I'm doing what we would call a single spiral on a handle. And I'm going around like this. And, you know, when we, when we have it set in the foundation manual, we square off in the center, we go out, we have a spiral to the plane of the arms here, then we square off again here, we come back, and we're up. And I could, if I were doing it by the book, 
Repeat that eight times like this. Or if I do it like dummy, I would do it like starting off this way and then decide that I wanted to play with my 10th rib and how would that feel. And then maybe I would wind up twisting it into a double spiral. And even if I had probably finished it eight times because you know, I was playing with the ballet dancer or I had that as a string, by the time I've gone to number eight, my movement pattern is nothing like where I started. So can we have these two different control rules? Can, can you tell me what Domini who isn't? By the book, <laughs> would have achieved that eight times because it would have changed, but it would have changed differently. And this is like Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> and what would the Domini who is who does this this way? What if I achieve I just only flow and no plastic? Again, from a movement efficiency perspective, there's something called grooving the pattern that shows up sometimes in motor control papers, not really in the research, but in, in motor control papers. And basically what it, what it means is when you repeat something in a similar way several times, the pathway becomes more and more efficient without you trying to make it so, right? So one could argue that by never sticking with something and trying to perform it the same way eight times, maybe you're missing that. But then at the same time, you're also opening up, again, all of these doors for variation. And once you find something interesting, and I don't, I don't know, I, I'm suspecting that when you find something interesting, you probably stay with it for a little while. Because that is human nature, right? When we stumble upon something that is interesting, it's like, ooh, this is interesting. I'm going to sit here for a moment and see what happens. And so that's going to fill, fulfill this whole other, again, like mental, emotional thing up here. So there's, there, again, there's so much value in both. From a centering perspective, again, just from being able to easily move away from center and return to it, I do think there is value. And again, sometimes sticking with kind of the same pattern repeatedly a few times, because then your idea of where center is becomes very, very clear. As I said earlier, I do think this is what weight training can provide. Right. Yeah. Like when I was getting into applying weights with a you know, one that I loved was just holding that weight up yeah. and then around because there was no argument about where it was center. Center was gravitationally shown. Right. There's also something that I think probably like the first workshop I took from you, you said a few times, what you focus on expands. So that's also, that's changing your experience of the exercise right there, but it's a deepening of particular spots that you're focusing on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think we basically covered all of my questions. The feeling in my body, uh, like now that you've explained this to me, is that probably where I would want to go if I wanted to improve who I already am, but expand the strength there, would be to just continue adding more load to my explorations and try to at least repeat that same sequence, say four to eight times, or set a timer for it. Yes. Yeah. And like I said, that's a really great way to start to build a little more um, systematic, like, um, I guess systematic would be a good word, but, you know, kind of progressive strength. Yeah. If, if you want that, you know, and that's the, that's always the thing, like, what does the person want, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what does the person need? Those two things we all struggle with as trainers. <laughs> totally. Um, okay, great. Well, considering that we're calling this newsletter, let's talk about sets, baby. Um, a drum, I'm going to sing one that. <laughs> okay, we'll see if I can, I, we'll see if the sound comes through my ass. Let's talk about that, baby. I was, Dominique sent me the, um, that song via Spotify and I was so amused when it came through. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> I haven't heard this since like seventh grade. <laughs> oh, <pepper> my heart. <laughs> totally. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're, you're welcome. Have a great day. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>